Good afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome to our roundtable, The Clown on Stage. I'm Rachel Stern, founding director and CEO of the Fritz Asher Society for Persecuted, Ostracized, and Banned Art based in New York. We discuss, publish, and exhibit artists that are not known to a larger public because they were suppressed by the German National Socialist regime between 1933 and 1945. The clown on stage doesn't get more dramatic than in Ruggiero Leo Cavallo's opera I Pagliacci, which was popular in the 1920s in Berlin and most probably inspired Fritz Ascher's lifelong interest in the, uh, in the subject. From about 1916, the artist created both scenic representations of the tragic love burlesque and studies of the clown as a single figure. But what, what is the appeal of the clown in performance? That's what we are discussing in this round table, which is part of Send In The Clowns, an interactive two-week digital project sponsored by Allianz Partners. The project was created by Elizabeth Berkowitz, who is also moderating this round table. Elizabeth is an art historian specializing in European modernism and modern art historiography. She currently serves at the Fritz Ascher Society's digital interpretation manager and previously was the Malone ACLS Public Fellow at the Rockefeller Archive Center. She has extensive experience as a university and museum educator, and her writings have appeared in both popular and academic publications. Welcome, Elizabeth. All right, thank you so much, Rachel. Um, I'm very excited for today's roundtable. I think this is going to be really interesting. As Rachel mentioned, this is week one of a two-week project called Send in the Clowns, and this week's theme is the clown on stage. Um, as Rachel mentioned, uh, Fritz Asher, uh, the artist, the, the, the artist who is at the center of the Fritz Asher Society's sort of uh, work at, at present, he was very much inspired um, by uh, Ruggiero Leon Cavallo's I Pagliacci, and, which was shown in Berlin in 1913. And he began, after seeing this opera, sort of a lifelong interest in the subject of the clown. And his very early uh, clown representations were very self-consciously on stage. Uh, so you really see the characters from I Pagliacci on stage in the setting in which he originally encountered the opera and then these characters. And so I wanted to today, sort of with our, our diverse group of panelists, really talk about the significance of the clown in performance as a way to kind of understand not only Asher's interest in the clown as a figure to be represented and why he might have had this interest in very deliberately and self-consciously focusing on the clown as a subject, a performative subject, um, but also to kind of look at the broader picture of clowns in um, the representation of a clown, not only on stage, but in visual art and in current clowning practice. So before we get started, I want to introduce our panelists briefly for the full bios. You can look at our website, uh, the First Asher Society, and you can look at our Send in the Clowns landing page. Um, but just a, a brief introduction. So we have featured today, we have Matthew Wilson, who is a director, actor, and fight director, as well as scholar and playwright. He teaches at the George Washington University's uh, Corcoran School of the Arts and Design and serves as Director of Graduate Studies for its Academy for Classical Acting in partnership with the Shakespeare Theater Company. He has studied, taught, and performed Comedia dell'Arte across Europe and North America. And he has a forthcoming book, Comedia dell'Arte in History and Performance from Routledge Press, um, as well as many other publications that also focus on the Comedia dell'Arte and the history of um, Comedia dell'Arte and Performance. Next, we have Ori Soltis. Ori Soltis teaches at Georgetown University across a range of disciplines. He is the former director of the B'nai B'rith Klutznik National Jewish Museum. He has authored or edited 24 books and scores of articles and exhibition catalog essays, including Our Sacred Signs, How Jewish, Christian, and Muslim Art Draw from the Same Source, Mysticism and Judaism, Tradition and Transformation, and Magic and Religion in the Greco-Roman World, The Beginnings of Judaism and Christianity, among many, many other publications. And finally, we have Trisha Manuel, or Priscilla Moosberger. 
uh, Trisha Manuel, uh, with, um, as the clown Priscilla Mooseberger, got her start clowning with Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey in 1982. She's the owner of Priscilla Mooseberger Originals, which supplies high quality clown costumes and makeup for over 25 years, and is also the founder of Mooseberger Clown Arts Camp. Um, she received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Midwest Clown Association and Clowns of America International, was honored with the Lifetime of Laughter Award from the International Clown Hall of Fame for her contribution for, to clown arts education and 24 years of Mooseburger Clown Arts Camp. So welcome to our roundtable participants. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm excited for the conversation. The format for everyone who is tuning in, we're gonna have about 40, 45 minutes of questions. Um, and then we want to leave time for you, the audience, to present your questions. So as we go on, if you have questions, things that emerge, please just put them in the chat. And then towards the end, we will get to them. All right. So to start things off, one of the questions that I have is, you know, what is a clown? How do we define a clown? Right? What are some of the attributes that we think of as characteristic of a clown? And this can be both historically and it can also be today in current practice. What do we think of? What makes a clown? Well, I'm willing to throw out a historical point of comment. <laughs> Go for it. And let my two colleagues bring it up to date. I mean, when I think, what, what, what the first thing that comes to my mind when you ask that question is going back to the Greeks and a comedic theater as like meaning serious. Um, and one of the, the, the obvious attributes of the clown or rather, I should say, the ancestor of the clown, the key character in, in, in a Greek comedy, is physical attributes, uh, over-exaggerated sexual attributes, for example. Um, and in the kind of classic formation that Aristophanes offers, where his comedies are in fact very serious, neologisms, all kinds of words that these characters make up that maybe the audience would get, and you and I would not, even if we understand standard Greek, because he's kind of made them up uh, in order to offer a comedic side to whatever the serious topic with which he's dealing. You know, whether it's the war between Athens and Sparta, or whether it's gender relations, or whether it's the personality of Socrates and the people with whom he deals. So it, 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 it introduces the clown in a way that is hardly clownish, except perhaps for the physical attributes that are exaggerated. Mm -hmm. If we fast forward all the way to the Comedia dell'arte or beyond that point to the present. And I think I'll stop because I suspect both of my colleagues would have something to say about Comedia dell'arte to the present in terms of representations. Well, if I may, um, I'd like yeah. to speak to the modern clown, which is where I have my education over the past 30 years as a performing clown and uh, working with clowns every day, talking to clowns and working with clowns. And yes, the first, the most certainly identifiable attribute of a clown is a red nose for the, for the modern workaday clown. You, as soon as you put a red nose on, you're a clown. You're identified as clown, even though lots of clowns perform without red noses. But to the average public, if they see a red nose, they'll, they'll, they'll say clown. And, but on the other side of it, on the inside, uh, what what identifies all the clowns that I know is this inner fire to give back joy. Mm -hmm. They really can't help themselves. And they'll put themselves in harm's way. They'll put themselves personally to be ridiculed. But true clowns will always, they just have a burning desire to reach out to the public, to lift their spirits, to communicate, uh, to entertain, to share their their inner dialogue. And it comes in many beautiful ways of performance, but it's an inside burning and yet it's an outside look that because clowning is an individual art form, it looks very, very different with each and every clown. Mm. That's really interesting. So we have starting out with Ori and Trisha, we have 
with Ori, sort of the, the structural function of the clown in ancient Greece, where you have um, this exaggerated, uh, physically exaggerated figure, but someone who is sort of used as a foil for more tragic narratives that are, are coming forward, a way to kind of put forward a slightly different spin on whatever is, is the main message of a play or um, a theatrical performance. And then Trisha, in, in your, in the more modern and uh, current clowning environment, it's also, you know, the motivation of the performer, what makes a clown from the point of view of the person performing, this inner desire or urge to bring joy. So it's, it's, it's two very interesting and very different functions of the clown in broader culture. One from a structural point of view, how does it work in a performance? And then the other one from the point of view of the performer um, in contemporary clowning, where it is um, this inner joy. So Matthew, I don't know where your, your take falls on this spectrum. I think those are all excellent answers uh, for, me, for me right now. I apologize for having to pop off a couple of times. For me right now, the clown is my dog who has immediacy and a need and a total disregard for what we're trying to do right here uh, because she is wholeheartedly present in what she's about right now and you can you can join that as a game or you can be <laughs> repulsed or offended by that um, Bakhtin says of Comedia dell'arte that it's theater without footlights and I think that's something specific to clown is the clown is right here with you clown is not going to live on the stage clown is going to come out at you uh, to be either your your compatriot or your provocateur or however you experience it but uh, there's no getting away from it hmm. that's interesting so in all three examples there is an immediacy it's something where it is going to be impactful and affect you um, in in some way that's the sort of function of the clown and sort of that you know going back to trisha that sort of inner need to bring joy it's something that you can't that urge manifests and perhaps you can't escape from it it's sort of in in your in your space for a purpose in this in the sense of bringing joy but um or for complicating a narrative or can i can i throw something else into this pot elizabeth and yes, let you stir it up it. yes because i'm thinking specifically of a Comedia dell'arte character such as Piero, who is the pagliaccio in the a play by uh, Leon Cavallo, the pagliacci, who is the quintessence of the clown, who while he is making us laugh, is weeping inside, he's sad inside, and we don't necessarily get it. And so he presents this kind of paradox or this ambiguity. And I think that's what one sees so often in Fritz Ascher's clowns, which is why he's drawn to this character, this particular clown character, who is alone, who is unhappy, who is weeping, and yet whose job it is to make us laugh. And of course, if his key inspiration is the Pagliaccio from Leon Cavallo's play, or, uh, and, and everything that comes there from, who at the end of the play has just stabbed two people to death, the woman who, not as the clown on the stage, but as the person he loves because she's having an affair with someone else and the guy with whom she's having the affair. And she plays on the stage, the one with whom he on the stage is in love and can't access. So all of these tormenting emotions have suddenly confused him to the point where he's murdered these two people. And the audience thinks it's all part of the play and then, you know, famously, his last words, you know, the comedy is done and the, and the curtain comes down and they have realized that there was no line to weeping and being tormented and torn apart. So it's interesting. So to you the have point where the uh, the end of the play is a tragedy, right? So this idea of a clown as a figure that is a representation of an extreme in some way, um, and that idea that particularly for Fritz Asher, as expressed in his interest in Ipagliacci, the the sort of extremes of the clown as performing happiness but inside inner turmoil. So that dichotomy is something that was really powerful. And I think, how, how do all of you read 
um, this, the idea that a clown is someone who is, where does, where does sadness fit in to either the historic role of the clown or the contemporary practice of clowning? Because there is, you know, the, the natural, counterpart that exists with extreme joy is 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 sadness and the other side and there's something you know where does where does that play in historically and then also today well if I can speak to the from what I know from modern clowns uh, one of my friends so wisely said Dion Amayer said uh, most clowns have had really miserable childhoods hmm. and when you get to know real clowns we all use our clowning as a healing process um, to make other people happy heals the hurts that we have mm -hmm. most of us are very sensitive people and we carry a lot of hurt within us um, and to to make other people laugh makes us feel valued it helps support our inner dialogue it helps us heal if we can make other people laugh we can heal ourselves and um, all the clowns that I know have some sort of inner hurt or burden that we carry. And don't we all do that as human beings? We all have inner hurts that we carry, but somewhere along the line, clowns, people who are drawn to the art of clowning, find that as our way of healing ourselves by lifting up the public, communicating with the public, whether our message be one of sharing our sadness or lifting up our joy and hopefully lifting up our audience but it's it's very it, it's i think it's clowns are just brave a mm -hmm. lot of us just say well we're not really great but we're brave and we'll go out there and and do it right now clowns are really suffering and across the country because we're all isolated we can't go out and clown because mm -hmm. of covid 19. so my clown community is um suffer, suffering terribly because we have all this sharing and love to give and we're struggling with new mediums of how to do that through zoom um mm -hmm. but we're uh clowning for the performer is a real um in-person tactile thing and mm -hmm. uh i'm really uh, i'm concerned about my clown community and uh, we're working with ways at mooseburger to to keep us all connected until we can get out there and share again. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, it's it's interesting to say. This. So, the idea that you have um, that there is this the desire to to bring joy that intense desire stems from inner pain or hurt or something of that kind. And then to think about the challenges as you're describing them of that need, the idea that it's a coping mechanism. But what happens when you take the primary mode of communication or expression of that coping mechanism away, which is the in-person grat instant gratification of bringing joy. When you take that away, you know, how can it function appropriately as a coping mechanism or most effectively as a coping mechanism? So that's very interesting. To sort of and, and I think what you're saying is so interesting, again, in comparison with the image of the clown that Asher, or going back to Watteau's wonderful painting of Pierrot, you know, the, they are cut off from people and what you're describing is exactly the opposite is how they thrive regardless of what they're feeling inside that may be sad or happy by their interaction with people bringing to people touching people metaphorically and literally and what Asher seems to emphasize and what that Watteau painting emphasize are clowns that defy that norm that they are really cut off and the the audience is it is away from them, laughing at them just from the exterior, having no sense of what's really going on inside them. And if they're isolated by the visual artist, boom, as Watteau does, or boom, 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 as Asher does, they capture that aloneness, which is not, it, 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 for you, the, you're describing an aloneness that is the danger that occurs when they can't be with the audience because of a condition such as the current one. So I think that's really interesting. interesting. Matthew, what's your take on the role of sadness in in Yeah, I, all, all very good points. Uh, Christopher Bays, who's uh, an American clown and director and clown teacher, uh, is the first one I heard say, the ha-ha lives next to the wah-wah. Hmm. That these primal emotions of laughing and crying 
are really <laughs> coming from similar places inside. It's interesting in theatrical history, the, the neoclassical tradition tried to say, look, you keep your tragedy over here and you keep your comedy over there and never the twain shall meet and that's the way we make good art. And yet so many of the people who made things that we were, would call good art didn't do it that way. I already mentioned the Greeks, even in, in a tragedy like Antigone, you still get a messenger who shows up and is a bit of a clown character going like, I didn't do it, I didn't see who did it, it's not my fault. I'm just here to tell you what happened. Please, please don't hurt me. You know, um, Shakespeare's Macbeth, the king gets murdered and the first thing that the next person you see on stage is the doorkeeper who's out here to tell us about how he's hung over and has to go to the bathroom. So <laughs> there's something about that juxtaposition of the highs and the lows that I think brings them all into relief. Mm -hmm. It's a true human condition in many ways, the idea that you do have that coexistence as much as, as you're saying, you know, in a classical tradition, you try to separate tragedy and comedy from human beings. You know, we, we can't separate those two aspects of our own lives. And I feel as though in many ways, the clown is sort of a, exemplifying the inability to separate those two aspects of lived experience. Um, so it's interesting to sort of put it in the historical context and think about it in, in terms of the narrative structure of some of the plays you were mentioning. Well, and, and it, it makes the clown heroic because what a hero does, or what a hero is, and I mean the word hero in a genderless sense, but I'm just using the gendered word for convenience. It's like you and me, only more so, more intensely. So what we experience and what we feel and what our issues and problems are, are magnified exponentially in the case of one who's labeled a hero. So if a clown offers that, offers us as both tragic and comic, as and, and, you know, funny and sad, happy and sad, weeping and laughing, then you arrive at a point in Western literature where you actually start, I think Merimee is the first one to do it in his play Le Cid, he calls it a tragic comedy. So he insistently puts the two words together. But when I think of a playwright, and I think Matthew will bear me out on this, sight unseen, unheard, the one who we think of in the contemporary world who just thrust that completely in our faces is Samuel Beckett, most famously, with Waiting for Godot. And even the way Vladimir and Estragon interact, the way they look, they don't quite have red noses, but just short of that, they're clown figures and that they're not funny. They're funny, but they're not funny. God, they are trying, God, there's, well, they're sad, but they're not sad, they're funny. And the whole play, of course, among other things, plays on that, it seems to me. So we have, I suppose, gradually become more and more conscious when we're presenting clowns, other than in a circus, and you might want to make a distinction between clowns in the circus and clowns in theater, at least in theater, of, of, of these, the blurriness of the line between these apparent opposites that they represent, that they depict, which really reflect what's in all of us. Interesting. Um, I want to actually, I want to return to that, that idea is that, is there a distinction between um, a clown who's performing in a theatrical setting, thinking about Commedia dell'arte, or in a circus setting today? Is there, is there really a distinction? I want to return to that in, in, in just a minute. But I want to also sort of think about the thing that has been sort of brought up is this idea of the impact of the clown on the audience with these extremes, is embodying these extremes, whether it's visible, whether that sadness that comes from, that's the inspiration for needing to bring joy is visible or apparent to the audience, or whether it's not, um, or whether we're in a situation as in with um, Ipagliacci, where that dichotomy of extreme tragedy and extreme sadness and extreme needing to present extreme joy is just a key part of the narrative. So in, in whichever, format, um, I want to think about the impact on the audience. What makes a successful clown performance in whatever context, whether in modern clowning, um, whether in the circus, whether in play, is there an aspect of catharsis? What should the audience feel when they interact with a clown who has done their job successfully? Well, since I think I'm, am I the only person in the room who's been on the circus? I don't know. 
I've done a trapeze, know. but I've not been a clown. Okay. <laughs> you know, the beauty of clowning is it's such a multifaceted art form. And clowns who perform on stage, if they're part of a play that has a clown in it, then they're actors portraying a clown. There's a huge difference between someone portraying a clown and someone who is a real clown. Mm -hmm. It's actually the difference between someone who's a doctor and somebody who plays a doctor on TV. Or a it's, president. Um, <laughs> um, so uh, when you're, if you're a real clown, meaning that you choose to be a clown and that's what you do, um, circus is so much different than hospital clowning versus um, as festivals and event clowning. I mean, there's so many different facets. It's so hard to, to put it in one little capsule, but for clowns, the true clowns, the whole purpose is you haven't succeeded unless you made a connection with your audience. You have to have to be true. What you do has to be true. It can be entertaining without being true, but to really move your, move your audience, Mm -hmm. um, it has to be true. And I've seen novices um, reach that truth of doing a very simple trick. Um, clowns who we taught in one week how to be a clown, do a public performance, and somehow they make that connection with a child or its parent, and the truth is there. You know, the emotion and the feeling and the truth mm -hmm. is there. And I've known clowns who are fabulous performers they put on a great performance, but the truth of connection isn't there. Mm -hmm. um, but when you get down to the true essence of what a, a true clown is, it's about that connection with their audience, a performing clown. It, it has to be that connection where your audience says, ah, I can relate to that. Mm -hmm. I can relate to that clown because they made a fool of themselves I don't want anybody to know, but I make a fool of myself too. So there it is on stage, somebody else doing what I do, but in a funny way, I can connect to that. Mm -hmm. So that's how uh, performing clowns, true clowns, it's like, if you can't be truthful, if you can't make that connection in your foolishness, mm -hmm. then it's just a performance. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, well said. Connection, connection, connection. Yeah. Yeah. And it goes, it goes back, Matthew, to your point also about um, that idea of, of reaching the audience, the idea that a clown is someone who sort of transcends the sort of edge of the stage, so to speak, and is reaching out and connecting with, with the audience. Um, so that's interesting. So a successful clown performance, a true one, is one where there is um, an emotional connection with the audience. In whatever form that takes, however it happens, there's an authentic human connection that happens through the art or the act of clowning, okay? Any other thoughts? What about the role of sort of the physical clown body or, you know, is that, you know, does clowning have to be a, a physical engagement or is there something, is there an aspect perhaps that is a little less, um, you know, you, I guess, um, physically demanding, maybe more cerebral, maybe more um, on, on a different level. Well, honestly, right now, because of the isolation of clowns, um, I have a program called Red Nose Readers, mm -hmm. where we had just started last year a nonprofit where clowns were going into uh, uh, schools, elementary age, before, you know, preschool and talking about what is a clown without any makeup on. Mm -hmm. And then they put their, talking to kids about what they think a clown is and then telling them, you know, who a clown could be, which is anyone, everyone mm -hmm. could be a clown. And having the kids help them, they put their makeup on and they transform into the clown in front of the child mm -hmm. and then engage them in the idea of reading and mm -hmm. using that as a tool to get them excited about reading and read them stories. So with that, um, the isolation of COVID, we've been able to do Zoom shows with the children. And it's still that connection, even though it's in a little tiny screen, but clowns all across the world and the country are figuring out how to make that personal connection. Um, even though we can't be there in person, trying to make that connection with the kids um, and actually having to re-identify re 
uh, identify what a clown is. And this has happened within the last 10 years is we have to rebrand ourselves and re-identify ourselves because if you ask a teenager what a clown is, they'll think of a scary monster from a movie. Mm -hmm. They won't think of a joyful, happy character right. because of what, our, what the media and society has done to the image of the clown has changed that immediate perception that a clown has to be a scary monster from a movie as opposed to a joyful character. It's, so clowns are really real clowns on the street, boots on the street are in the, in the process of rebranding ourselves so that we can actually continue to be clowns. And, and, and I wonder too, I'm, I'm both amplifying, but also sort of offering this as a question. It doesn't, it obviously not only your, your question, Elizabeth, about the physicality of the clown, but also that most fundamental of human tools, which is language, verbal language, mm -hmm. clearly is not necessarily the instrument that a clown has to use to connect. And it's not only that it can be, and more often than not, is nonverbal, but I'm thinking in particular in, in putting together the idea of verbal, nonverbal, and physicality. I think of Marcel Marceau. And I'm thinking, therefore, of mimes. And his persona, based on the makeup, is, as it were, clown-like. And yet, I would never think of him as a clown. And he starts out, I'm talking about when he's still a, 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 a youth during World War II. And they're trying to rescue children. And he keeps them calm by entertaining them in his clown manner. And he, emerge, he evolves to become Marcel Marceau with that very distinctive kind of face makeup. He's funny, but you wouldn't think of him as funny because you immediately sense the not only seriousness, but even the tragedy that somehow lurks inside him, even if you don't know his biography. Um, how all of that kind of works together. And, and, and Trish, how do you, you know, all those pieces when you think, and, and what you just brought up, of course, my God, I'm thinking, of course, the movie It, it right? The, um, what's his name's? novel and it's the horrific clown and I, it didn't occur to me until you said it of course it, a lot of kids today they think clown that's the image they've got in their heads and isn't that tragic that they've got it's that been tragic for us it's yeah been, it's and for them for community yeah well you know we do my job as a um i catch clowns at the beginning level um i catch the people who just say you know what i've had this passion my whole life but I've had a family to raise, a job, but um, I need to do this now. Now is the time in my life my kids are raised, I'm getting close to retirement, and it's like, I've held on to this dream my whole life, now I'm gonna do it. Uh, and that's where I have the very beginning level people say, I've always wanted to be a clown, can you help me? And the, the, the beginning level is, okay, let's talk about who you are and what your passions are and what your tools are, because clowns use all different kinds of tools. Some clowns will be silent. Some clowns will use music, puppetry, magic, uh, origami, uh, just silly slapstick, um, just conversation. Uh, I know some of the most incredible clowns have had no training, but they're great conversationalists. And they can just talk to people and say silly things and, and just make that immediate connection. And, you know, one of the silliest things I use when I'm performing is a, a ukulele that, <laughs> that looks like a chicken. And I'm no great musician, um, but I'm kind of a hack. But I play this thing and it just makes people laugh because um, it's ridiculous. <laughs> and that my character is very ridiculous, it's just ridiculous. So. I think we have to, when you're training clowns, you have to say, okay, what's your passion? What will, what will set you on fire? You don't have to be able to do X, Y, or Z. Let's talk about the few things that would just light your fire and let's work on those. And it might be a verbal skill, it might be a mime skill, or it might be something totally, something that I've never thought of. So tell me what it is and we're going to build on that and help you develop that, that that way to communicate with your audience, whether it's going, you plan on being in front of hundreds and thousands of people or just one child at a time. It's, so that's fascinating. And uh, Trisha, I absolutely love your ukulele. That was fabulous. <laughs> oh, it's a chickalele. 
Oh, t- yeah, even even better. And I honestly wish I had one because that would have made the pandemic so much better. Um, <laughs> it's awesome. Um, so on on that note, Trisha, as you've been describing and uh, sort of the process by which you embrace, um, you know, prepare prepare yourself to be able to be a successful and effective and impactful clown. I'm wondering, um, Matthew, from your perspective, thinking about the Comedia dell'arte tradition and how it's, how it's practiced today, is there a, how alike is the process that, you know, of, of being able to be successful in this art form as a Comedia dell'arte clown? How similar is it to the process that Trisha is describing for a, a different type of contemporary clowning? Uh, that's a that is a very dangerous question that uh, that a lot of people would have very strong feelings about, <laughs> depending on where they come from. I mean, I I think of um, the Comedia dell'arte as being a tree that has roots that grow deep into the Greco-Roman past and through uh, Byzantine mime and, and medieval traveling players, and then takes its its trunk in early modern Italy, but then has all of these branches that spread out far and wide, some, some of which are, are far away from each other and don't bear very much resemblance to each other. So I'm, I'm a little more of an ecumenicist about this, is that I'm willing to see that people have different perspectives and, and, and put their stamp on the, the Harlequin of France in the 17th century is not the Arlecchino of Venice of the 16th century, is not the circus clown of today, is not the Pierrot of um, Pagliacci, but, but they're all interrelated and, and interconnected. And I think that, um, you know, if we can try to draw these historical lines of this happened and this influenced that, and, and, um, but we also want to be careful always historically about saying, well, this caused that. We don't necessarily know that. We know that this preceded that, but we don't know the relationship. And I, and I think there's also that open possibility that someone who's humorous and has a point of view and sits and looks around the world is going to notice some of the same foibles and triumphs independently, wherever they are, however they are. So I think for me, um, a lot of clown is about point of view and that ability to distill. Clown is true without being real. As Trish said, you put on the red nose and, and it's a nose that signifies I'm not a nose. And everybody knows that's clown. This is my nose, which is not a nose. This is my ukulele, which is a chicken. That there's something about, um, even Vladimir and Estragon, they live in a world with one tree. So we look at them and go, oh, I recognize that as planet Earth, but it's not my, you know, I have more than one tree <laughs> in my planet. Theirs is the kind of day where you wake up and there's only one tree here now. And, and there's something about that that hits us as familiar and yet accessible because I know I'm not seeing reality in its, in its stark actually, actually. I'm seeing something exaggerated and distilled and, and purified. There's an element of a sort of safe space by seeing something as both familiar, but yet it's different enough that when emotions are expressed or um, take place in this scene, it's, it's a safe space to kind of explore any action that occurs because it's not, it's familiar enough, but not so familiar. And I think there's an element of the clown where it is, you know, the, the freedom, the ability to express perhaps extreme emotions, extreme silliness, extreme, you know, any any sort of feeling or, or uh, emotional response, but it's, it's, in a, it's in a space that isn't so close or so exact to our own lived experience that it feels threatening. It feels like we're losing control. It's, it's that, that place where things can happen and we can kind of enjoy. Um, enjoy others who are safely expressing it. Um, Absolutely, and that permission, I think, is, is Trish is saying, to, to be honest mm-hmm. in a way that maybe isn't appropriate or maybe isn't conventional or maybe isn't uh, good manners or, or the way you would like to be seen as being, but it's, it's sure honest. Mm-hmm. Well, so I want I wanna turn actually to the Comedia dell'arte since, um, uh, I Pagliacci was the inspiration for Fritz Asher, um, since the examples, the, the visual art examples that Ori was bringing up all sort of focus on committed L'arte characters. And since it is an art form that, as you say, Matthew, has 
you know, it it's, has, has many different branches and many different iterations. I remember many years ago, I was working on a project where um, there was a piece of mice and porcelain that was a Comédie de l'Arte character, and I think it was even Pierrot. So it was the German porcelain that has the French iteration of the Italian theatrical form as tableware. So it was a very, you know, a multiple levels of translation that kind of happened with this one particular art form. So in brief, if that's possible, um, for some such a robust form, um, could you describe for the audience what the Comédie de l'Arte is and maybe briefly in your opinion, you know, why it is something that has had such a lasting impact culturally from its in brief, 500 years of highly contested history and historiography. Yep. Go. <laughs> in, in the 16th century on the Italian peninsula, when people had a great interest in uh, theater and culture and ancient things, some folks were doing that in academic settings, in universities, some folks were looking at Greco-Roman uh, sources, and some folks went, you know what, I could, I could take this and make a living with it today. I could make people laugh with these kind of ideas today. And so they start playing with masks, which they totally misunderstand historically, but it works for them at the time. Half, half leather, half masks with big noses and big brows. And, um, and they start playing with physical exaggeration. And they start, in their case, needing to travel around. They, um, they're an early form of professional theater that says we're taking the show on the road. So I'm not gonna build a theater and invite you to come and see a famous playwright like they're gonna do in Paris and London. We're gonna, we're gonna travel and, and go wherever we have to go. So the immediate problem, especially in the Italian peninsula in the 16th century, you go one town over and they speak another language. Mm -hmm. If you keep going, you're, you're further removed still. And, and these actors in the 200 years, 250 years of the golden age in the, in the 16th to 18th century are traveling all over Italy, as, as far up as London and, and as far over as Moscow and everything in between. So they have to develop a style of comedy that's gonna get laughs and pay that isn't based on their own local politics, their own history or their own cultural witticisms. So stories about young kids in love, that's going to play. Mm -hmm. Stories about a, a greedy boss or a, a dumb employee, that's going to play. Stories about uh, boasting war heroes or a stranger who comes to town, that's going to play. So they, they create these very um, distilled social types of the greedy old man, the know-it-all intellectual, the young lover, the bumbling servant, the wily servant, and, um, and these plots that are based on really basic, basic human endeavors, love, hatred, the hunger, uh, war, and then the, the ability to improvise from beyond there. So looking back on it, we've got half masks, exaggerated physicality, uh, social types of people in society, and then this ability to improvise based on today I'm in front of this audience in Madrid, tomorrow I'm in front of this audience in Berlin, and, and I've got to play whatever it is for them at, in that moment. So there's an aspirate, there's a, a universality, an aspired universality to the art form, which seems to be a thread that is also kind of continuing today um, in terms of uh, the idea of, well, you have to make someone laugh. What is going to do it? What is going to connect? What is going to be there? And that is something where you have to look beyond the sort of specificity of, Matthew, as you're saying, of, of to a certain degree, language or dialect or politics um, in the early years of the Comité de l'Arte, um, you have to have something that's going to translate as broadly as possible. And I think it's interesting to sort of think about some of the themes that have kind of come up, this idea of the essential humanity of the clown as, as the clown is someone who sort of writ, you know, these emotions are writ large to a certain degree. And thinking about the origin of the Comité de l'Arte as something that needed to aspire from a practical point of view to a universal or is as close to a universal way of communicating as possible in order to work, in order to bring in the money, in order to have a successful um, troupe. So from a practical origin to perhaps a more emotional um, iteration today or in order to be successful and to connect. So that's a very interesting. And so I wonder if that isn't part of why, I mean, we see the Comédie de l'Arte characters cycling through, particularly in the modern era, I think 
Um, I, I think about the um, Italian futurists when they returned after the First World War to Commedia dell'arte figures as, as you know, sources of inspiration. And obviously Fritz Asher, who, you know, in his later years when he returned to the figure of the clown, he took it out of the sort of very deliberate positioning on stage and it was more that figure itself as, as someone who kind of haunted his um, later works as well. So I, I wonder how much, you know, that, you know, that idea of a universally effective figure plays into the continued affection for these characters as it cycled through it, particularly into modern, modern times and modern visual representation and perhaps even performative representations as well. So it's interesting to think of that. Yeah, I think so. And there's something else exciting to me in, in early 20th century appropriations or, or treatments of commedia and, and clown type material is you have this relentless realism throughout the 19th century in, in novels of Tolstoy and Hugo and, and uh, Dickens or in the stage work of Stanislavski and Chekhov and Ibsen and Strindberg and Zola and, and Vaughan or um, the development of the, of the photograph and, and of cinema. And then immediately you have a bunch of artists going, I don't want realism. I don't want things to, to look like they look. I don't find that interesting or, or revelatory. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're looking for other kinds of resources and other kinds of innovations. And in some cases they find that in global majority art forms. You think of Picasso and his compatriots getting a hold of African masks and going, this makes me rethink what it is to depict a face or you think of Artaud or, or Brecht seeing Chinese opera for the first time and going, this is a, an entirely different view of gesture and music and makeup and costume. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of them also go, if we can look at other points of theatrical history where realism wasn't the game, mm -hmm. then we're gonna find a kinship there. And, and as you say, with Italian futurists, uh, futurists marionettes, automatons, they're all interested in Comedia dell'arte. Um, Picasso and Gris are very interested in Incomated Alarte early on. Nijinsky is doing Harlequin ballets. Uh, and we have you know, Pagliacci and Love of Three Oranges happening in, in opera. This, this whole counterpoint to realism in the 20th century finds maybe an, an unlikely bedfellow in Renaissance clowning and Comedia dell'arte to go like, we're looking at the world the same way and we want to see a nose that's not a nose. Mm -hmm. Something, yeah. something very modern about, about a, yeah. a old art form. Or are you were about to read? No, I was just thinking, you know, I, I, that's, that's fantastic what you're saying. And I'm just uh, sort of ruminating about what's happening in Europe during that time period politically and scientifically, but I really mean technologically. What I'm really talking about is the uh, exponential updating in the style of warfare and the ability to mass kill during battles as compared with really all of history uh, back to the Greeks. I mean, it shrinks, shrinks, shrinks back to the Greeks, but it, it's exponentially larger once you get to, let's say the Franco-Prussian War in the beginning of the 1870s in terms of what you can do with bigger guns. And of course the, 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 the child, the, the deformed it child, which is not a clown, of that is World War One, and maybe it's not accidental that in the twenties, in particular, a lot of the stuff you're talking about it started er much earlier. Impressionism started earlier, but you know, after photography, then we don't want to look. As you said, we don't want to see it that way. We want to try and rethink how one sees on a canvas. But there's an explosiveness that we get in the twenties that roars. Not, I don't think with ebullience because the war is over, but with escapism, because we're trying to get away from what we're starting to realize we are as a species, given from you know 1760 to 1914, we thought, look what we can do because we're so technologically blah, 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 blah. And suddenly, yeah, look what we can do. And it, it brings to an explosive explanation, exclamation point, the sort of thing that you're talking about in all the arts that they, it, 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 it it responds again, exclamation point wise, be, uh, continuing where you're talking about explosively, pun intended, after World War I. And, and that's where Usher first really, Usher for one, first really comes into the picture, pun intended, with respect to this. 
And I don't have to say what happens from that point to our own time in terms of what you just so brilliantly described. I think one of the things that's also interesting, Ori, about framing it in connection to the post-World War I era, this the need to escape from extreme realism in the face of the horrors of the First World right. War. Um, the irony is, is that the artists who then turn to Commedia dell'arte figures, like the Italian futurists, have been for decades maligned as being realists. So, yeah that they are somehow returning to figuration. They're returning to a recognizable, identifiable art form. They're going away from a more, um, you know, uh, abstracted view of the body is, you know, it, it, it's an accusation that is the antithesis of thinking about, well, why would somebody want to return to this art form? Why would you have in the modern era this need or desire to look at a heightened reality that is like ours, but not quite? Um, so it's it's an interesting thing, the way that historiography kind of comes in and kind of distorts perhaps our ability to engage with certain moments in history, perhaps for what they were. Um, so thank you for that. Um, so before we kind of turn to just a, a few questions that came in really briefly, um, I want to ask about the clown and the idea of an outsider. Right, so we've talked about the clown as a figure who is emblematic of a heightened reality that is like ours but different. The clown in performance as sort of giving a safe space to, ex to be silly, to be extreme, to express emotions, to have extreme joy. Um, but what about the clown as perhaps an outsider figure? Is this um, a narrative that rings true to any of you in whatever respective medium you, you view the clown? All clowns I know are outsiders. <laughs> that, I mean, that's why we end up being clowns is our communication. Because if you, uh, we are, when we embrace, embrace ourselves and are honest with ourselves, we're the people who laugh too much or too loud, mm -hmm. who a lot of, a lot of um, ADD, mm -hmm. ADHD people mm -hmm. um, are clowns because of the, it's just, we're drawn to to that kind of communication but mm -hmm. all the clowns i know it's like we kind of stick out like that sore thumb in our communities and and even if you've held it inside and tried to hide it when you finally burst out and become the clown if you ask your family members are they surprised they'll go no we're not <laughs> <laughs> and and we so many of us you know we're not the class clown mm -hmm. but it, when it finally comes out it's not a surprise to anyone so um all clowns i know you know we struggle to fit in that square peg in a round hole and then we just give up <laughs> and go this is who i am i'm a clown i'm not ashamed of it it's who i am i own this and my rubber chicken collection can embarrass my family but it's okay <laughs> you know and then we find our own tribe and we come together mm -hmm. and we support one another because when we're all together um what my clowns say to me when we have this gathering called mooseburger camp and clowns who have never been to the camp their first time um they're they're they blurt it out it's like i'm home mm -hmm. I found my own kind. Mm -hmm. I finally found people who think and act like me mm -hmm. and I feel at home and I'm free to express myself. And that's why clowns have been suffering because we haven't been allowed to gather mm -hmm. uh, at our conventions and at our conferences and we're this weird subculture. So um, yeah, clowns are outsiders and those of us who perform as clowns, we all know it. And some of us are more successful at channeling our performance and accepting our differentness and others suffer more because they haven't found their tribe and fi haven't found their support system. But yeah, we're, we know, all know we're different. <laughs> you know, there are uh, a number of interesting and important 20th century Jewish visual artists and Asher is one of them who specifically seem to use the clown image as an outsider image and therefore as a symbol of the Jew as outsider. And I think of a, a kind of a classic 
uh, image is one by uh, Jacques Lipschitz. It's a, it's a sculpture, it's called Pierrot Escaping, done in 1927 or so. And Pierrot is holding on to the ladder to climb out the window. But of course, it's a sculpture, very flat-ish. So the ladder is attached top and bottom to the window frame. So in fact, he ain't going nowhere. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the window frame behind him, interestingly, not the frame, but the window looks like a series of four crosses. And Pierrot himself, very stylized, quasi-cubistic, looks like a Star of David. Mm -hmm. So it becomes an image of the Jew trying to escape his identity, perhaps, or escape the Christian world, or escape by changing his identity from being Jewish within the Christian world, but who can't escape. And again, it's the 20s. And by that, the time he's done this sculpture, Hitler has been ranting and raving for four years. He's not in power yet, but the atmosphere is energizing in a very negative way for Jews in Europe. And so Pierrot for him, seems to be rather directly that kind of an outsider symbol with a specific subtext, the Jew. And one can arguably see that in some of Asher's work. One can even see that, although less obviously, in Chagall, because one doesn't typically think of him as a purveyor of dark otherness. One sees him as a purveyor of light. Although how he handles the circus after the death of Bella, as opposed to before the death of Bella, is I think noticeably different and reflects a darkness that emerges for a while anyway with him until he finds love again. So yeah, just a couple of thoughts about that, you know, the outsider idea and a particular way in which it can be and has sometimes applied. Matthew, do you have any insight into the clown as an outsider figure? Yeah, I mean, I think those are both really well said. Um, just basic dramaturgy in relationships, it's, I have to figure out who said, somebody, somebody said that there's only two stories, a person goes on a jury journey or a stranger comes to town. Mm -hmm. it can fundamentally, if you winnow it down, stories are about trying to get in or trying to get out or getting sucked in or getting pushed out. Mm -hmm. And if you're, if you're improvising, if you're doing audience play, those kinds of basic, basic, how do we, how do we revert the, the characters back into a, a kind of action? You're always playing with that dialectic of who, who's on the outside of what and, and who's on the inside of what and who, who wants to be wherever they aren't right now. And that's the, that's the struggle. Brett Skelton always said, comedy was you get in you get into trouble and then you get out of trouble <laughs> that's comedy and that's how we teach our clowns it's like okay what are you trying to do it's not going to work so you are in trouble and what is your clown brain what's your clown logic which isn't real logic how will that get you out of trouble and and you think about it in that sequence and that's how you create comedy that's great well I think we're, Rachel, I have a feeling we are out of time, but I think it's a really, really wonderful way to end this conversation with that idea of the clown as an outsider, but this sort of universalizing outsider, the idea that not only is it um, the structure of, you know, as Matthew, you described, all plays can be kind of boiled down to one of two motivations, one being, you know, get in, get out, someone trying to get in, someone trying to get out. Um, but also the idea that the clown has a symbolic function in terms of artistic representation. Um, and we see that with Asher in particular. And then from the point of view of the performer, the clown performer, um, where, Krisha, as you say, you know, all of your clowns are outsiders in some way. And to become a clown is a way of kind of realizing your potential or who you are, embracing who you are at its, at, at its essence and embracing that otherness or outsider function. Um, so it's, it's sort of a, a beautiful way to kind of wrap up this discussion about Fritz Asher's clowns and the clown on stage. And I just want to thank it, all of you for your insights, for your participation, and for your conversation. And with that, I turn it over to Rachel. Thank you so much, everyone. This was a really, really interesting and engaging uh, conversation. We have a few questions, but I'm you know, and comments, but I'm afraid we don't have time for that. But 
the really good thing is that this whole program Send in the Clowns is uh, continuing tomorrow uh, between uh, 12 and 1 p.m. Matthew is actually taking over the Fritz Asher Society Twitter feed. So uh, whoever, you know, if you have something to say, to ask, uh, please uh, join the Twitter feed uh, tomorrow and uh, uh, dis, uh, keep discussing there with Matthew and uh, with all of us. And um, uh, I will uh, send in the follow-up email, I will send you a link to the whole schedule of Send in the Clowns. We have a very exciting next week coming up and this week is also only half over. So there are lots of interesting and fun things uh, uh, happening. So please come back and please stay with us. And until then, please stay Stay healthy and stay well. Uh, be well, everybody. Goodbye. <laughs> Thank you all. This was fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>